Okay, so this is P.2 radical or exponents and radicals. So we're on the radical part of this. I'm going to put um, part two. And again, this is a really long one. We were only able to get through two pieces of information and two, two sets of examples, um, but there's seven of them and then the practice. So we'll see how far we get. Um, hopefully this section is not too, too long. So, but it is very important. So we definitely need to cover it. Um, an expression involving radicals in its simplest form when following conditions are satisfied. Okay, so if you follow these three steps, you'll know if it's in its simplest form, okay? First is all possible factors have been removed from the radical. All fractions have radical free denominators. A process called rationalizing the denominator accomplishes this. We will discuss that in a little bit. Then the third thing is the index of the radical is reduced, okay? So let's go see what that's gonna mean for us. Now, to simplify a radical, Factor the radicand into factors whose exponents are multiples of the index. Write the roots of these factors outside of the radical. The leftover factors make up the new radicand. I'll show you an example of what that means, okay? Um, actually, before I go to the next piece, I do wanna show you what that looks like. So let's say if I'm doing the cube root of um, 128, okay? In order for me to simplify that, I need to write this out. So I know that 128, I think, let me see, two to the power six, maybe? Nope, two to the power seven, maybe? I'm just guessing on the calculator. So apparently 128 is two to the power seven, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to group these in threes. So if I have three, then I have three more that make six twos. And so I'll just have one two left over. That's seven twos on the inside, okay? Well then if I use that one property that says I can do two cube times the cube root each factor, right? That I have there like this. And then we have another property that says the index and the exponent will cancel, index and the exponent will cancel. And here, those are not the same, so they do not cancel. And I'm not gonna write the one exponent anymore. Then finally, if I multiply those together, I end up with this expression. This is the simplified version, okay? I've also seen another way of people doing this is when they try to do the cube root of 128, um, the first thing they do is write it in its prime factorization form, which um, I have mentioned in the face-to-face -face class. Um, prime factorization is super helpful, and we will talk about it um, when we're working on these problems, okay? But if you figure out the prime factorization of 128 and you get two to the power seven, essentially what I've seen people do is off to the side, they say, how many times does three go into seven? Three goes into seven two times, but that leaves you one remaining. This is how many twos will come out. And this is the exponent that will stay in, okay? Remember, we never dealt with this two. This computation started off with just dividing three and seven, okay? It's just a coincidence that the quotient ended up being two. So you end up with your base on the outside and your base on the inside. Okay, that's just a standard practice, right? You have the base on the outside and the base on the inside, but how many are gonna come out and how many are gonna go in? You're gonna have two of them that come out and the exponent that stays in is just one. And two squared we know is four. And so you get that same exact result as we got there, okay? So it helps a lot when you have huge exponents, like if this exponent was 25, do we really wanna sit here and go two to the third, 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 eight of them, and then have one left over? No, right, we don't wanna write all of that. So this little, um, I guess like shortcut, it definitely helps, okay? 
So now it says radical expressions can be combined, which means added or subtracted, but only when they are like radicals, okay? What does it mean to be a like radical? It means it has to have the same index and the same radicand. They may not have the same coefficient, but they definitely have to have the same index and the same radicand. So notice here the coefficient is one, here the coefficient is three, and here the coefficient is one half, but they are all like radicals because they all have a square root and a two on the inside, okay? Whereas these two, they both have square roots, they both have the same coefficient, but the radicands, the insides are not the same. I don't even care if the coefficients are same, that's literally irrelevant, okay? But I want the indexes to be the same, which they are, but we also want the radicands to be the same and they're not, okay? So you could not combine these two into one radical. Whereas these I could, depending on whether they were added or subtracted together, okay? Um, and then to determine whether two radicals are can be combined or not, you should always try to simplify them first because they may not look like they have the same radicands, but they may in disguise, okay? For instance, um, hmm, I'm trying to think. For instance, the square root of two and the square root of 18. Those may not look like they're like terms, but they are. They are like radicals. They do not have the same radicand right now, but that's why they said to determine whether or not they are the same kind of radical, you need to simplify first. So this, if I do the prime factorization of 18, um, your prime numbers are, if you don't know, okay, are two, three, and no other even number because prime numbers by definition are numbers that can only be divided by one in itself no other number, okay? So four, six, eight, all those numbers can be divided by two. So you'll never see another even number on the prime numbers list. That is key because anytime I have an even number and I'm trying to break it up, if it's even, I'm always gonna keep using two to bring it, break it up until it's no longer even, okay? So like that 128, for instance, 128, I would have used two and then this divided by two is 64. Um, eventually when I get high enough, you'll realize that, well, 64 is even. So we automatically know it can be divided by two. This is even again. So I automatically know I can be divided by two, even again, even again, even again. And now these are prime as well. And I can't go any shorter. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven ends. And that's where that two to the seventh came from. Okay. So the same thing here, I'm gonna do in a minute, it's even, so I'm gonna go nine, okay? Now, nine is not on this list. Let me get far enough on this list so that you can tell. 15 can be divided by five, 16 is even, 17, 18, 19, 23, 29. You normally don't have to go this far up. 31, I believe, is prime. 33, no, 34, 35, no, 36, 37, 37, 39, no. Um, I'm not gonna go forever, but you get the idea, okay? There's a whole bunch of them. Um, I mean, there's an infinite number of them, right? Because the numbers go on forever. But if you notice, it goes from seven to 11, it skips right over nine, okay? And since I know that that's not a prime number, I has to be able to have two factors. And I know them, they're three times three, right? Um, if you don't know, excuse me, what the factors are, try these. You know two's not gonna go into it because it's not even, so just try the next number, okay? You know it has to end in a five or a zero in order to try the five, um, but all the other odds, I just go in order until one of them works, okay? So notice this is a prime number, this is a prime number, and this is a prime number. So my answer is gonna be two, there's only one of them, and three to the power two. Now I'm gonna write this as two to the power one times the square root of three to the power two. I also know that the index is an imaginary two and the, so is the exponent. So we're just gonna end up with the radicand on its own. 
And then finally, they don't usually like um, your coefficients in the back. They like them in the front of the radical. And I don't need to write that one exponent, okay? So really, the two expressions I have here, the simplified version of this does match. They're both square roots, the indexes match, and the inside, the radicands match. It doesn't matter that the coefficients don't match, okay? That just means when I combine them, I will combine the coefficients, okay? So if you're saying you have one radical square root of two, and then I'm adding, let's just say I'm adding three square root of twos, well, what does that mean? That means I would have four square root of twos, right? You're just counting how many you have. So, of course, we need to practice this simplifying the radical, right? Um, I do not do this. I do this, okay? Um, so I don't necessarily try to think of whether or not they're perfect powers or leftovers or on, uh, no, 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 no. It's just too much, okay? I'm gonna show you how to do it using the prime factorization. So you do have to remember those prime numbers, okay? Definitely put them on a note sheet until you memorize them. But two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, um, 15, no, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31. I'm just gonna stop there, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go with 24 and it is even. So I'm gonna divide by two, I get 12. That's also even, I'm gonna divide by two and I get six. This is even, I'm gonna divide by two and get three. And three is a prime number here. So all my primes are these guys, okay? So the way I'm gonna write the inside is instead of writing 24, I'm gonna write two to the third power and then three to the one power. Then if you split it up, I'm not gonna write the little invisible one. These will cancel leaving you with just the two and you don't need to write the one. So you just have the cube root of three, okay? Some people do this step in their head. They know that the three will not cancel with the one so they will have that left over, but this three will cancel with that three so the two will come out, okay? So people do not write this step all the time, okay? Now 48 though, it is even, so I'm gonna divide by two and I've already done 24. So I know exactly what that's gonna look like, right? So I get one, two, three, four twos. This is two to the fourth times just one three, three to the one. So I know this four is gonna cancel that four so the two will come out. Here though, um, the four and the one will not cancel out. So I will still have the fourth root of three. And then 75, again, 75, I'm going to write as, um, it doesn't end to five, so I'll divide by five and I get, um, what is 75 divided by five? 15. And then 15 I know is three times five. All of these are prime numbers, so I can stop. And so then if I write this, I'm gonna write the square root of 75 x third into five to the power two, because there's two of them, three to the power one, and then x to the power three. Now I'm gonna actually start incorporating that division rule, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the base fives. I'm going to take this little index two that's invisible and divide it by its exponent. I get one, two, one times two is two. So one that comes out and zero stay in, okay? Then I'm going to talk about what's going on for the base um, three. So you've got two on the outside, the index, and then the exponent on the inside is one. So two does not go into one at all. So that zero that are gonna come out, zero times two is zero. So I still have one that stays in. Now when I talk about the base X, I have two index, but I have an exponent of three on the inside. So two goes into that once, two times one is two. And so I have one that will come out and one that will stay in. So what is that gonna look like? 
all the bases that I used were five, three, and X. So when I rewrite this problem, I'm going to write it just like this as the template. Now, all I have to do is put in the exponents that supposedly were supposed to go in and out. So I have all my bases on the outside and all my bases on the inside. So notice that for this one, one was gonna come out and zero, we're gonna stay in. Here, zero, we're gonna come out and one was gonna stay in. Here, one was gonna come out and one was gonna stay in. Now remember, anything to the zero power is a one. Five to the first power is five. Three to the zero power is zero. I'm sorry, is one. I said it and then I said something else. And then X to the power one is just X. Then I've got this square root, five to the power zero is one, three to the power one is three, and X to the power one is just X. And if I simplify that even more, I get 5x and then the square root of 3x, which is the same thing that they got. Now, everything that I've done, most of everything that I've done is all mental math. I don't need to write any of that stuff down. The only thing that I needed to write down was this and this. Okay, so I'm going to show you how that happens with the next problem. Like, how do I go from there to there? Because really, I should only be writing down two steps. This step with the prime factorization, and then all of this is mental in pink, and this is my final answer. Okay, watch. Let's do it for the next one. Okay, so we've got the cube root of 2 to the 4th, a to the 4th. I'm going to, that 24, I already know how to do it, right? We know that 24 was, well, gosh, now I can't even remember. <laughs> I think it was two to the third times three to the one. Yes. And then I have this a to the fourth power. Okay. So three goes into three one time. So it's an invisible one with none left over. So I will not have any of the twos inside the radical. Three does not go into one at all. So no threes will come out and I'll still have that three to the one on the inside. Then three goes into four one time, but I'll still have one left over, okay? And then we know that when we have one exponents, we do not need to write them, okay? So that's how we know that we can shortcut for that answer. Okay, so eventually you want to be able to do them that quickly. You want to be able to get the prime factorizations. Eventually you'll memorize some of them um, and then be able to go here. Okay, but just to be able to get to that final answer a whole lot quicker. And I messed up. It's a cube root, right? So it should have been a cube root. But 2a cube root of 3a and 2a cube root of 3a. And then the last one in this section is basically because you don't know whether X is positive or not, and you have even and even, um, you do have to have the absolute value bars around that um, variable, okay? You don't need them around the five because the five is positive, okay? But you need them around the variable because you don't know what X is and you don't know if it's positive or not. Okay, so... Moving on, let's talk about combining like terms. So I missed a page here. No, I'm not missing a page here. Oh, it does just go straight into it, okay? So this one's talking about combining like terms. So the first thing they do is they take this and they simplify it. They take this and they simplify it. When they do that, they end up with these two answers respectively okay again i don't do it the way that they do but that's what you end up with okay how would i have done it let me show you if i have two square root of 48 i would have taken that and written it as two um two to the fourth power times three 
to the first power. That's the prime factorization. Then I know that I've got this two here. This is a little index of two. So two goes into four, two times, none left over. Two does not go into one. So I still have the square root of three to the one. Now exponents first, that's four times two is eight square root of three. Now, if I'm talking about this one, 27 is actually three to the third power. So remember the index here is two. You've got a three already there. And then two goes into three once with one left over. So three to the one is three times three is nine, three. And that's exactly what they got there. Now, when you've got to combine them, you're basically saying, I had eight square root of threes, right? As if square root of threes were an item. I have eight of those, right? But then somebody's trying to take away nine of them, okay? So let's say I had eight of these things, eight dollars, right? The square root of threes will represent an item, like a dollar. So I have eight dollars, and the bank's trying to take away nine of those dollars, right? That's going to put me in the negative one of those dollars. Okay. So just keep that in mind that the radicals, when they're like terms, they end up becoming like an item. Just like when you were doing this. Right. I should probably put a bigger number like 13x minus 3x. You have 13 of these x's minus three of these x's. So that leaves you with 10 of those x's. Okay. It's very much like combining like terms. You just manipulate the coefficients essentially, okay? Now, same thing for here. Again, we can go through it. Uh, 16 is actually going to be um, two to the fourth. So that means two to the fourth, if you're doing the cube, that means one will come out and one will stay in. You got one, two out and one, two in. This doesn't have any exponents, so it stays. Now here, this one, 54, 54 divided by two, um, this can be written as two times three to the third. And then of course you have X to the fourth, right? So when that happens, the two is not gonna come out. It's gonna stay in. Um, only one three is gonna come out. Three goes into three once. Three goes into four once. So you have one X that came out, but you still have one X left over on the inside, okay? Now, these are not like terms because I don't even know why it told you to try to combine them, you can't. They do have coefficients and they do have the same index and the same radical, but notice this one has a variable X and this one does not, okay? So it shouldn't be telling you to combine like terms. These are not like terms. So those guys are not like terms. The only thing they did is they didn't combine the like terms. What they did was they factored out the thing they have in common they factored out the cube root of two X. And when you take that out, you're left with two. And when you take that one out, you're left with the minus three X, okay? And so I just rewrote those. Remember the commutative property? This times this is the same as this times this. So they didn't really combine anything. I do not like that they use that uh, language there. All they did was factor out the cube root of two X because they both had that multiplied. Okay, so finally we get into rationalizing the denominator. This one's a good one. This is like, they said it's not simplified until the bottom doesn't have a radical. Um, but what if it does have a radical? How do you get rid of it, right? That's this process, okay? So it says to rationalize a denominator or even a numerator if they happen to want you to do that. This is not standard practice though. Um, if they want you to rationalize a denominator or a numerator that has two terms, okay? One without a radical and one with a radical. Doesn't matter whether there's plus in the middle or minus in the middle, okay? The, the strategy is to multiply both by the conjugate, okay? Now keep in mind that if the A is equal to zero, then you're just changing the sign in the middle, which means you only have the radical and you would only be using, um, the same radical or an opposite sign radical. It doesn't matter really, okay? But the same sign will work. Now, 
It says for cube roots, choose a rationalizing factor that generates a perfect cube, okay? So if you're trying to get rid of a cube root of five, you probably wanna multiply by a cube root of five squared so that you could end up with the cube root of five to the one times five to the two, which is five to the three, which gives you the five without the radical, right? So you've got to choose your exponent wisely so that it gives you this index value so that it can come out, right? So let's go see some of these examples. So the, the first one they give me is the one I just talked about. Okay, here they want you to rationalize the denominator. Now notice this is not two terms. This is just one term. Two terms would have had a plus in it or it would have had a minus in it but this does not have a plus or a minus. So you need to visualize this as one term with two factors, two times square root of three, okay? So it's one term with two factors. So then if it's only one term, according to the rule, I'm supposed to use the same exact radical. So notice that they only use the radical part, square root of three and square root of three. The top, you end up with five square root of three. In the bottom, you end up with these are the same index, so you can actually do three times three and get nine. And the square root of nine is where this three came from, okay? And then when you multiply the two times that three, you actually end up with six, but notice that this is equivalent to this. And the cool thing about this expression is it doesn't have a radical in the denominator, okay? Which was the whole goal. Now, if you have that one, I already talked about it. You only have one. You need three in order to come out of the house. So you multiply by two more. But whatever you do to the bottom, you must do to the top to keep this fraction proportionate. Remember, a fraction is a proportion, okay? And if you're gonna modify one of those proportions to keep it the same um, size or the same proportions, you've gotta also do the same thing to the top, okay? It's just like a camera, you know, the, the photo is not your actual size, but it is proportionate to your actual size. And if someone were to mess with those ratios and make you top heavy or bottom heavy, it's going to distort the image, right? It's not going to be the same person that you see in that photo. It's going to be a distorted image of that person, okay? So it's the same thing with fractions. If you're going to multiply something on the top, you have to multiply it to the bottom as well to keep the image the same, okay? So that it looks like the same person, okay? In mathematics, you're doing this manipulation so that it can look different, but it's still proportionate, okay? I mean, I do look different in my photo. I mean, in person, I'm not two inches tall, right? <laughs> so I do look different from my photo in, in life, but in mathematics, you definitely want it to be proportionate still. Okay, so now what happens if they ask you to rationalize a numerator? It doesn't matter whether it's the numerator or denominator, just pay special attention to what they're asking you to rationalize. So they basically don't want any radicals in the top. Now we have two terms here now. So what they've done is they've asked us to use the conjugate. So instead of a minus in the middle, they put a plus in the middle. And what they did on the top, you have to do to the bottom, okay? Now from the top, you use a difference of two squares, right? You have one with the plus, one with the minus. So you're gonna get that guy squared minus that guy squared. At the bottom, you have two times this. Now five square root of five squared is five, square root of seven squared is seven. When I subtract those two, I do get negative two. And if you notice this negative two can reduce with that negative two, giving me just a negative one on top and then no more parentheses with the two on the outside in the front. Okay, so um, let's see. Let's keep going. Now it says the definition of rational exponent. So this was the biggie, the one that I told you I could not explain why this equaled this or something like that. I think an M was on the outside and the N was on the inside. I don't know. But anyway, there was a rule of property in there that I could not explain this way, okay? 
But now that they're talking about it, I can, okay? So they're telling us that um, the nth root can be written as an exponent, okay? It's just a fraction exponent. So every single radical in existence can be written as a rational exponent, okay? So there's your definition right there. This radical expression can be written as a, ra uh, a rational, a fraction exponent. Rational is just a fancy word for fraction, okay? Ratio, remember I told you fractions are ratios, proportions, okay, important. That's where these words are coming from. So um, another thing to notice is that even if you have um, this exponent, remember we talked about whether the exponent could be on the outside or it could be on the inside and they're still equivalent? That has to do with the rational expression, okay? Um, so if you write this like this, you know that you can tear apart, right? We know that we can tear apart um, whole numbers and fractions. So then I could use the commutative property, write those the other way around. And then we have that rule that only if you have an exponent raised to an exponent, do you multiply these two? So it turns into this if you go backwards. And then finally, this can be written like this. And so now you've made the statement that that is equivalent to this, okay? Now here, it's the same thing. You're gonna write this as m times one over n and then What's going to happen is you're going to have, um, you're going to change it into that. And then this little guy is going to change it into this. Okay. So you basically have come up with two expressions that a to the m over n can equal this version, or it can equal this version. You decide whichever one is more convenient for you. Okay. Now back to that property. How in the world? Why, right? So remember, this radical can be written as one over the power n. The nth radical can be written as one over the power n. Then the one on the inside can be written as a to the one over m. And then if I use my power rule, one times one is one, m times n is m times n. And then I can go backwards from here to here and say that that's my index. And then that's my radicand, but I don't need to write the one power, okay? And so notice that that's the same thing. M and N are multiplied commutative properties, the same as N times M, okay? Lots of definitions here, and it is in your best interest to learn all of them. Otherwise, when your teachers speak to you and they start using these definitions, you are not gonna understand what they're talking about, okay? Um, it's super important. They always, I always hear expressions like math is like another language. It truly, truly is. Okay. And once you've come to terms with that and you take it for what it is um, and you accept it, you, the better off you are. Okay. So math is its own language. So keep that in mind. All the words that we use are meticulously picked convey what we're trying to explain okay so it's very important if i say words that you're not understanding what i'm saying it's because you don't know the vocabulary you don't know what each of those words mean okay and that's a problem it's a common problem in mathematics so it's super important that you definitely learn your vocabulary okay if you see any single word that you do not understand what that word is, you should be looking up what that word means before you move on, okay? Do not just keep reading and think you'll figure out what that word means. It does not work like that, okay? If you don't know what something means, ask or look it up. I mean, in this day and age, we have Google, right? You can Google anything. <laughs> you can even YouTube anything and get a whole video of somebody explaining everything to you, okay? It's an amazing time right now. Um, and due to that, I mean, I've heard the expression a million times and you probably all have too, um, that ignorance is a choice at this point in time. With such a vast um, access to knowledge, I mean, it truly is. So truly make sure that you are familiar with your vocabulary, okay? If you are not, look it up. If you saw this rational word and you didn't know what rational meant, 
you need to be looking it up. Now, I try to help a little bit navigate through all the vocabulary by letting you know, like, rational is just a fancy way of saying fraction, right? Um, power is another way of saying exponent. Um, I try to kind of throw in little things. Radicand means the inside of the radical. Um, but you really should know these things. And if you don't, you need to start making index cards to remember them. But vocabulary is so super important, um, especially with texting. I know we use the texting app to communicate with each other. And if you're asking me a question and you're not using the correct mathematical language, I don't understand what you're saying or what you're asking for. Um, and vice versa, if I'm using the mathematical language to explain what you should be doing or how to do the problem, and you don't understand that language, what is the point of me explaining it to you, right? You have to learn the language to understand, okay? Okay, moving on. My, my, let me get off the soapbox, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, so yes, like I said here, you have a choice on which version you want to use. The most important thing is that the numerator will be the exponent or the power, and the denominator has to be the index, okay? That is the best way to explain it when you try to change over notation, okay? And it goes vice versa. If you're going in this direction, you have to remember that this is gonna be your numerator and this index will always be the denominator. So it says, when you are working with rational exponents, fraction exponents, the properties of integer exponents still apply. For instance, if you're doing this, you know you need to add the exponents and so you end up with this result, okay? Um, what does that mean for a problem? Remember two to the one half is saying, the same as saying the square root of two to the one. And this one is saying the same thing as saying the cube root of two to the one. And we talked about um, what happens when what's on the inside matches, but what's on the outside doesn't, okay? Um, so you do, you can, you would not be able to combine these. These are not like terms, right? They're not like radicals, um, but you can, you can't add or subtract them, but you can multiply them together using this rational exponents idea, okay? So instead of writing them like this, you can write them as exponents and then you can apply your exponent rules. Okay, now in calculus, it's super important that we do know how to change forms back and forth between rational exponents and no rational exponents. So we will definitely have some problems in the homework or in the practice that ask you to do that, okay? So pay special attention to those. Oh, okay, but we're now finally at the end of our examples. We're getting there, getting there. So for instance, they want us to simplify this. Well, the first thing you would want to do is I would not, I don't do these problems the same way. So, <laughs> I mean, that's one way, but it's just not me. I always um, make negative exponents positive. Negative exponents positive. That's the first thing that I do. Once I do that, then I can apply exponents to um, products or quotients. What is a product? It's like when you have something times something else. What is a quotient? When you have something divided by something else, okay? Um, then, I will simplify radicals. Or no, we need to put in radical form. And then simplify radicals. Or just simplify because the whole thing's radicals, right? Okay, so now these two, sometimes you can switch these two. Those two can be switched, but 
the rest of it, I would not, okay? So for instance here, I'm going to take care of this negative exponent. We know that in order for us to make it not negative anymore, it's got to switch over the fraction bar. So that is going to become a one over negative 32 to the power four fifths, okay? Then the next thing I'm going to do is apply my exponents to products or quotients. Well, this is 32, not three times two, right? So we, might, we don't have step two in this particular problem. Then we're going to put in radical form. So five is the index. And then four is the exponent. So if I do this here correctly, let's see. I can type that in my calculator. Five um, root parentheses negative 32 raised to the fourth. And it does tell me that it's 16. Okay. Now here, it's the same thing. I did get the same thing as they did as well, okay? Here, if I make anything, I see this exponent is negative, but be careful. This is a lot like that case with the two, with an exponent versus the negative two to the exponent. This negative exponent, this exponent period, only applies to the x. If it applied to the three, it would be in its own parentheses inside this bigger parentheses, okay? So when I'm writing this, I'm gonna take care of that negative exponent, but I'm gonna have five X to the five thirds, and then I'm gonna have three, which stays put because it does not have an exponent. The exponent is like a positive one, but the negative exponent will go downstairs to become positive, okay? Then if I put this over one, Notice we don't have any exponents like on the outside to apply to any quotients or uh, products, but um, we do want to put these. I would not put these in radical form yet. I would actually simplify the exponents first on this one. So five times negative three is negative 15. And then you have um, X to the five thirds. And at the bottom, you have one times this, which is just X to the three fourths. Now you can change them into radicals, but it's much easier just to subtract the exponents. So I'm going to do, um, yeah, I'm gonna do five thirds the top minus the bottom. So five over three minus three over four. And the calculator says that I'm gonna get the new exponent of positive 11 over 12. Okay, and since it's a positive exponent, I don't need to mess with it. It's all over one, okay, like a whole number. So this is the final answer, and that is what I got there. Now remember, this is a 12 index. So we already know that when you have a 12 index, um, well, I don't even know why they say x cannot equal zero. It really doesn't matter. The cube root is, the 12th root of zero is zero. Oh, I see why. No, I don't understand why they have a negative or x cannot equal zero there. It really doesn't um, matter if it is. Oh, I know why. Look at this form. At some point, x was downstairs, right? And you cannot have a zero downstairs. So the fact that this expression was expressing an x in the, in the denominator we can't have zero in the denominator. That's why X cannot equal zero. I see, I see. Okay, here we go. So this is in radical form. So they changed it into its exponential form. And then this fraction actually reduces to one third. And then you just put the rad back into its radical form and notice that you've reduced the index, okay? Um, the easiest way to do is just to reduce these. If you see they have a common factor, like I can divide both of these by three. This divided by three is three. This divided by three is one. And it's the same result, okay? Here you've got that double, right? And we know the rule that says if you've got the double, you could just multiply. And then you can put that in its prime factorization. Then you can put that into its radical, rational exponent form. You could reduce that rational expression and then put it back in its exponent, expo no, back in its radical form. 
Okay, here we have something that has the same base. So you can still apply all those same power rules. So since I'm multiplying these, I should be doing four thirds plus a negative one third, which is the same as doing four thirds minus one third, okay? And four thirds minus one third is actually one, and we never need to write one exponents. So you can just write this all on its own. Why can X not equal one half? Remember that this is a negative exponent. So two X minus one to the negative one third means one over with a positive one third. And the fact that that expression is in the bottom means that that expression cannot equal zero, okay? So if I add one and then divide by two, that's where the X cannot equal one half comes from. Now, um, this thing is not defined what x equals one half because even if you just look at this answer, yeah, it's not a real number. It's the exact same thing that I'm mentioning. You can't have a zero down here in the bottom, okay? Zero to the negative one third is one over zero to the one third. And that's exactly what I was saying you couldn't have here. You couldn't have zero to the one third. Okay, so we have some practice problems in this section. So the square root of 125, if you write 125 in its prime factorizations, you get five to the power three. The index here is two. So two goes into three once with one left over. And so the answer is just five squared of five. Now here you've got 40. So 40 is two to the power three times five. Again, the more of these that you do, the more um, you'll be able to memorize them, okay? So, So then um, two to the third means one, two will come out and there will be no twos left over on the inside. And three does not go into five, so the five stays on the inside. So you just have two square root of five. Here we have four cube root of two to the six times three. I think that's correct, let me check. Two to the power six times three, yes. And then this one is three to the power four. And so then now we have this four here that was already there. And then three goes into this twice. So we're gonna end up with two squared. Three does not go into one. So that three will stay in and three goes into three once with none left over on the inside. Three goes into four one time with one left over, three goes into three, one time with zero left over. So four times four, I get 16 X cube root of three plus three X cube root of three. They have the same indexes, the same radicands, and they also have the same variables with the same exponents. So I can combine these into 19 X square root of three. Now let's see the next one. Here it says to rationalize this denominator. This is the cube root. So I need two more fives in order to get a five cubed. And then once I get that five cubed, I can just write the denominator as five. In the top, I get 125 cube root of five squared or instead of writing what five squared, I can just write 25 because that is five squared. So I get 125 and then cube root of 25. These can reduce. So I get 25 cube root of 25. Since it'll be over one and I don't have to write one denominators. Now here wants me to rationalize the denominator. There are two terms there. So I do have to multiply by the conjugate. 
which is just a plus. But what I do to the bottom, I must do to the top to keep the fraction proportionate. So in the top, I'm going to distribute this 3. I get 3 squared of 15 and 3 times 3, which is 9. At the bottom, this is literally the formula for the difference of cubes. So I end up with this thing squared minus this thing squared. So I have 3 squared of 15 plus 9. These cannot be combined. This has a radical. This does not. But I have 15 minus 9. What is um, 15 minus 9? 6, I think. Yeah. But these can all be reduced. So notice you have three terms. You have two terms in the top separated by a plus sign and one term at the bottom. All three of these have to be reducible by the same number in order for you to reduce at all. And all three of them do. Three goes into three once, three goes into nine three times, and three goes into six twice. Notice that I only reduced outside stuff. I did not reduce the radicand because that is on the inside. It's not the same as the numbers that are not in radicals, okay? So I'm gonna end up with one square root of 15 plus three over two. Another way that I've seen people do that is if that doesn't make sense to you, is whatever you think that they have in common, factor it out. So here, I think those have a three in common. So I'd get this in the top. And if the bottom has the same three in common, I'd end up with two. And then these will cancel and you notice you get the exact same answer, okay? So I have seen it being done that way. Finally, we get to the last page. So it says, write this radical expression as a rational exponent expression. You have x to the fourth and it's being multiplied by this, okay? So all you do is you change this into its rational exponent. Remember, the index goes at the bottom, the power goes at the top. Then if I'm multiplying these two guys, we've got to add those exponents. So 4 plus 2 thirds is actually equal to 14 thirds. And it just wants it to be written as a single rational exponent expression. So this is it. That is going to be super important when you get to calculus. When you get to calculus, you have to do something that's called um, the power rule of derivatives. And you have to have it. You have to have x's with the power in order to be able to do it, OK? So if you were given this and asked to find the derivative of that in Cal 1, you couldn't do it like this, OK? Or you could, but it'd be like really hard. and that process to learn it isn't doesn't happen until after you've learned the pro, the product rule for like a whole chapter. So it's super important that you're able to manipulate it into this so that you can apply that quick rule, okay? So there's only like two of them or maybe two of them in the homework, but this is actually a really big concept, okay? If you're making a note sheet or a note card for a calculus class, this is definitely one of them, okay? Now simplify the rational expression, this one. So I'm gonna do the negative exponent first. So that means one over 25 to the three halves. Then I'm gonna change this into its radical. So the index of two and the cube, and then two goes into three once, but I still have one left over. So then I have 25 and the square root of 25 is just five. So this ends up being one over 125, okay? Again, this one is super big, okay? It is a big deal in calculus. So definitely know how to do that one. But that is it. This, were, this section was very long. I mean, I don't know if you can see, but look how thick <laughs> all those pages were for this section. So this is a very long section. We did have to break it up into. Um, but that's that. We're done. We finished it and we made it through P.2. So I'm going to stop here.